Thank you, Margaret. Thank you for everything. Thank you all for being here, everybody involved with Tree and with this wonderful bookstore. And I'm just so delighted, so delighted to be here. Jim, what a treat to read with you. Barry was right, you are a wonder from top to bottom. <laughs> and that's my mom. Everyone say hi to my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> I will read from The Last Temptation of Bond, but I would like to read a, a prose piece that's fairly newish from uh, a memoir that I'm working on. I've spent some time on the island of Crete ever since I was 18 years old, and I'm now 50, and I've been back four or five times or something. So this is a piece from that. Happy freaking birthday to me. Experience the wonder of southern Crete's charming locals and time-scented hills. November 10th, 2010. I can't ignore this wound another minute. I tell my husband, Stu, something is really wrong with me. The motorcycle tailpipe burn on my leg will not heal, and it's swollen and oozing pus. It's the size of a diagonal slice of rotten eggplant. The edges are purple, and the skin around it has tightened and pulled away from the center, which looks like raw goat that's been in the fridge too long. I thought if I let it breathe and kept it clean with the rubbing alcohol and gauze I got at the mini mart, it would take care of itself after a few days, or at least scab over and start to heal, but if anything, it's worse. I watched my friend Marcos put some raki on a cut on his hand yesterday. Why do you do that? I asked him. It's like medicine, he says. We don't have this in Canada. I snatched a glass out of the Taverna kitchen, poured a shot of the awful homemade rot gut that tastes like motor oil on fire, took it back to my room and cleaned the wound with it. It stung like hell, but I had to admit it felt better afterward. This shit's good for something after all, I yelled to the room, cackling maniacally as the booze dribbled into my sock and the smell of rotting goat carcass wafted in from the dead animal dumping ground directly under my balcony. I take off my sock. It's my last clean pair. I should have learned when I was in this town 30 years ago with these same men that it's not the smartest choice to drink too much wine of Sta uh, uh, too much of Stavros's homemade wine with lunch at the Samaria down at the waterfront and then climb on or into a moving conveyance of any kind, whether I'm driving, driving it or not. At 18, being tossed around the cab of someone's blue pickup on the hairpin roads at 3 a.m., the Metaxa bottle sloshing over my legs. I wonder we didn't all die. The driver is drunk as the rest of us. Same now, I've learned nothing. I'm positive this thing is infected, though I can't feel the booze on my leg anymore. I can almost smell this thing decaying. I would wash these sweats that have been transferring bits of goop back and forth from it for a few days now, but I can't wear my shorts while I wait for my pants to dry in the breeze on the balcony because I don't want anyone to see this horror on my leg. I can't put my jeans on either because they scrape on the wound and make it worse. While the wound festered for four days, I hid it, knowing I couldn't see the doctor. It was election week, and everything, including the clinic, was shut for days. So I went yesterday, and of course she wasn't there. I sat on the infernal steps out front for an hour, finally gave up, and limped back up the hill to the taverna. This goddamn never-ending trudge up the steepest road in Greece, me sweating in plus 35. Do I have a fever? I don't know. Georgos, where the hell is the damn doctor in this backwards, dark age, one horse Cretan fishing village? He calmed me, held my shoulders, and said, This day she makes her stops to all the villages. She be here tomorrow. I know this. You want I phone her? I ask her to come to see you. No, no, Georgos, ashamed. I stopped his hand as he was reaching for his cell. He's not my personal everything service. How dare I go off on him and this village I love because the doctor is making her rounds out of town. It's nothing, Giorgo. It can wait till tomorrow. Signal me. I'm sorry. He says, you must see the doctor. I have a big birthday party for you tonight. I don't want you to be sick. The last of my birthdays Giorgos and I spent together was my 19th in November of 1983. No infected leg wounds back then, which is fortunate, as I don't remember there being a doctor within 100 miles of this village back then, when he and I were teenagers and our biggest worry was stumbling home after the nightly Metaxa drinking contest. Today I see the doctor, finally. She's 28, tops, friendly and gentle. Deutsch? I shake my head. English? She mercifully asks. Yes, please, I sigh, all my years of Greek study going right out the window. I lift my pant leg to show her my burn and she winces. Christ, how bad must it be to make the doctor wince? Yes, is infected. Please climb upon this. 
she says, and motions me onto the examining table, where she pours that orange shit all over it and cleans me off. Who the hell's seen iodine since the 1970s? You need medicine. No shit. And while she's bandaging me, I tell her, I'm allergic to penicillin and I'm on blood thinners. She's frowning. Great. She confers in Greek with her nurse, who's looking through cabinets, full to bursting with beautiful, gleaming, ready to dispense bottles of tablets and ointments, a pill popper's wet dream, one of which I pray like hell she will reach in and grab and say, here, take these. God damn it, I'd risk the penicillin side effects. I'd risk the feeling of silverfish running under my skin and crawling out my eyeballs if she could just give me it right now and save me a trip into the mountains to the pharmacy. But I dismay as she closes the cupboard again. There's nothing in there for me. Afterward, she hands me a prescription. My Greek lessons are of no use to me trying to read this. I open my purse in her office. Postocustizi, I ask her, feeling calmer already, my Greek returning slowly in the aftermath of her care, my cool down leg feeling less like burnt moussaka and more like a warm slice of baklava, all wrapped and ready for dessert. Nothing, she says. It is free. I stare blankly at her a moment before remembering to thank her for cleaning me up and being kind to me. She smiles and walks me to the door, her hand on my back. The next sentence is three pages long. Pardon me for having to take a little drink. So, now I'm all disinfected and bandaged with a prescription in my hand, having been told I have to go to the pharmacy in Vrisas to get these Greek pills, and God knows when they're going, what they're going to do to me, so I walk up the road, stick up my ass fashion, as I don't want to bump my leg and cause a pus explosion now that I'm finally bandaged. And I'm whispering all this to Yorgos because Michalis is there drinking wine, and I don't want him to know I burned my leg on his bike while he was giving me a ride back up the hill from town, that I need to get to Vrisas somehow, 40 minutes away by Mountain Road, so I can get this medicine. And I show the prescription to Yorgos, who reads it to me. These are good, he says, as if he knows. But Yorgos' cousin, the taxi driver, is on the north coast today. So Stu says, maybe we should go down and rent a car for the day from Damolis and he'll drive you up. But Yorgos says, Damolis, he has no insurance because the people are all gone. But Pentalis, he's the other taxi driver, and he will take you back and bring you back for 50 euro. And I say, sold. And Yorgos says, me, I will shoot my gun for good luck. <laughs> go. And Stu and I hop into Pantelli's car and hairpin it for 40 minutes to find the pharmacy in Vrises doesn't have the pills I need. And oh, you have to go to Vamos, which we do, after all heartily swearing in Greek another 20 minutes into the mountains, me terrified of the same lack of medicine in every pharmacy on this blessed island, Pantelli's quickly saying, me, I don't know Vamos well. Where, mercifully and by the grace of Jesus Almighty, they have the meds at the pharmacy on Main Street, and now I need to eat something so I can take one. So when we get home an hour later, I wolf down some leftover goat I find in our fridge and wash a pill down with scotch, thinking, well, there goes my partying for the rest of our trip, as I'm sure booze will make me sick. But I decide to experiment, because what the hell? It's my birthday, and if I'm going to die from these pills, I should die before the party and not during it. So I sit and stew while I wait 20 minutes for the pill and the Jack Daniels to take effect, sick with worry about insects crawling over me. But as the minutes go by, I seem okay, and then I gulp a big glass of wine to see what happens. After all, the can's right there. If I need to barf, wouldn't be the first time. And I discover that booze miraculously does not make me sick after all, like the pharmacist warned it might. These drugs rock. So I continue swilling on top of the antibiotics, wash my pants finally, and doll up for Yorgo's birthday party for me, which consists of I have no idea what, but will certainly be bursting with food. I saw him in his red apron earlier, hacking up a goat skull in the back room. Scotch and racky for everyone, which I don't realize I have to pay for, till Yorgo says loudly, would you like to buy everyone a drink? <laughs> And I say, sure, and children squeak out songs for me on their lyras in the pungent tank of gunfire stink. There, find that shit in your Greek island paradise brochures, Mr. and Mrs. Potential Tourist. Happy freaking birthday to me. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. I've never read that out loud. I wanted to see how it would go over. Uh, I'll read a piece that's fairly self-explanatory, um, but I will tell you that I was watching one of Pierce Brosnan's James Bond movies in which uh, Miss Moneypenny finds a virtual reality simulator. She puts some glasses on and she can sort of make fantasies that she, whatever she wants to do to James. But she's interrupted and I decide, well, that's hardly fair. <laughs> 
The Last Temptation of Miss Moneypenny. I know better than to touch Q's things. I run my hand along the unseen hood of this invisible Aston Martin Vanquish as it shudders beneath its silk black cloak while his back is turned. It vibrates slightly, sends a weak shock through my hand. The car blends nearly perfectly into the lab. I can see the legs of hurrying white-coated technicians through it, through the space it occupies and where there should be a solidity. Those legs quiver slightly as the effect fights to hold itself stable. I'm tempted to lean the full length of me across it, to feel its cold heart press my thighs and my throat. You've told me about the virtual reality simulator Q rigged into a pair of shades to assist in your continued training. You've told me how I come to die in one particularly disturbing program through no fault, fault of my own or yours. I am dead, or so you say, before you can draw your PPK and prevent it. You're able to save M, though. Interesting. When I sneak back in tonight, the lab is deserted. You've left the glasses on the edge of a counter for someone else to put away. I place them, mirrored, stylish, over my eyes, and stand on the motion sensor beneath me. Your last program runs before me in a frightening blur of near reality. I see from your vantage point, M shooting, my own death captured in a false training world for James Bond to practice in case this office of MI6 is ever infiltrated by Spectre or Smirsch. Even in death I look prim, afraid to let myself be seen as anything less than professional. I scan the program with the remote I find next to the glasses. The choices run past my eyes as movie credits do. The Bond 2 attack simulator looks interesting, designed for female agents who will run into you in the field in situations of grave danger and overwhelming carnage. Being perhaps slightly more vulnerable at that time, given the tragic and critical circumstances, they'll need to know how to resist you, how to talk themselves into not succumbing to your volatile need, your demanding thrusts and bombardments. They need to know how death excites you, that the moment of the kill causes an instant and near painful erection that you will relieve however you can. If they can get their hands on this program, Russian double agents would find it especially useful in resisting your promises that you'll make love to them day and night if only they'll stay on topic and continue to explain the mechanism. <laughs> I choose the female agent training program and I'm suddenly off balance as I see you as real as you were when you strutted into my office this morning and tossed your hat on the coat rack. You walk toward me. Your thin blue tie is askew. There are only inches between our bodies, and you're breathing heavily, your eyes taking in all of me as they've never done before. Something like warmth touches me from your face. I reach forward to straighten your tie. You don't resist. I pull your tie toward me and lean back on my desk, forcing you over me. I lie on the lab floor, spread myself, feel its cool marble collarbone against my back, my buttocks. A pleasant recorded female voice built into the program prompts me to resist. Be firm with him, she tells me. Demand he stop immediately. This is a place of business. His actions are sexual harassment. His hand finds my breast. I fumble for the remote on the floor next to me, choose options, and turn off the dialogue prompter. All around us are dead smirsh henchmen. M sweats in a corner from a flesh wound you inflect in the simulation. The advice for me to listen, not to listen to your flirting, hangs in the post shootout air. I push the kill M button on the right lens. M crumples a bullet to the temple from an unseen gun around a corner. Your body is above mine, the wool of your suit jacket cool under my fingers. You drag your lower lip in a moist upward journey over my mouth. Your right hand picks expertly at my blouse buttons, moves down, works, through me, works me through my proper MI6 uniform. Trigger finger snaking under my skirt and into my panties to draw a tight circle at my center. Money penny. Oh, money penny. The thick sex in your voice, your cock against my hip, your fingers finally inside me make me arch, cry out my hands over my head, send exploding paper clips and top secret dossiers flying from the desk. A rubber stamp reading for your eyes only clatters to the floor. You kiss me quiet. I pant your name, James. A door whispers open. I tear the glasses from my eyes. I'm spread like moist and bleeding roadkill on the immaculate floor of Q Branch, a hasty reassembling, my legs quivering as I fight to hold myself stable. I tuck the glasses into my jacket pocket. 
I haven't seen them. I'll tell Q tomorrow. 007 must have ruined them. Eventually, he ruins everything. <laughs> Poor Miss Money Penny. I'll close with two uh, kind of funnish poems. The the main character is an is unnamed. Her name is well. Her name is One, and she's sort of Bond's foil. She's also a, a super sp a super spy and super villain uh, in her own right. And she decides she's going to have a party to get all the Bond girls together to plot the demise of James. Everyone's just about had it. <laughs> this is called the real thing. The girls swill the Vesper martinis one has made for them. She has put on a Nouvelle Vogue mix and their cover of the undertones, Teenage Kicks, smooths its way around the swinging room. Some of the girls stroke tumblers full of rusty nails, slopping over with penis-shaped ice cubes, a few drops slipping down their drunken chins. Bond girls litter the house, air-kissing one another's cheeks. Pussy, it's so lovely to see you. It's simply been ages. Honey Rider, so good to see you too. Mwah, mwah. Tink. Darling, where did you get this lalay? A light lilting laugh sweeps over the girls in the kitchen. Cigarette smoke spiraling out of lipstick mouths, the talk heady and fun. One's iPhone rings insistently, the James Bond theme rattling from her purse in the bedroom. Drambui sucks the cool lips of chilled crystal tumblers already sloshing with four fingers of famous grouse. Sixties dresses and hot pants in clutches in the dining room. A few girls in bikinis, knives strapped to their hips. A cigarette waves in the air. The last time I saw James, I said, you know, darling, every few years you change your look so completely, no one can recognize you. A volcano of laughter. One meanders through bodies, gently nudging girls aside with her shoulders. She's pouring champagne with one hand, Pinot Grigio with the other. Each girl she passes kisses her full on the lips. Mouth, tongues of girls take over all the empty places between her lips. Out in the driveway, someone drops a crystal flute. Oops. So nice of you to have us over, darling. But you must have a reason. Pussy pats one's ass and lets her hand linger there. Come, spill your secret to Auntie Pussy. One's face goes dark. Her phone rings. She thinks of him, alone, in another hotel. How he hates hotels. One pours the last of the girls into the waiting cab, waves and blows kisses, then leads Pussy to her bedroom. Pussy on her knees, her mouth between one's legs before she's even halfway out of her green hot pants. Her phone rings. So you can see why I couldn't read much of this when I was on Sheila Rogers' show. <laughs> And she actually made a joke about it. She said, you know, I wish you could read more, but we're running out of time and the censors. <laughs> so it's very, it's so fun to be able to read it. I'll close with this. This is the morning after. Um, one makes a phone call to, to James. Stop and pick up a bottle of wine. James, it's me. Stop and pick up a bottle of wine on your way over. Please, I'm wrung out and I don't feel like leaving the house. There was a bit of a party here last night, and I could use some hair of the dog. We had the music up loud. I didn't hear your messages till this morning. I know, but five of them? You must have known I was busy. Oh, just some girls, nobody you know. <laughs> I promise you're the only one. Now stop being silly and get over here. I hope you don't mind the place is a bit of a mess. I thought, a view to a kill? We haven't seen that in ages. <laughs> I told you, just some of my friends, but we got a little carried away on the lalay you left here. Honestly, you've never met most of them. Good. See you in a bit. James, you heard me. I'm not going to say it again. Okay. See you soon. Me too. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>